I'm Jeff Harrison, a senior at Wynnum High. Welcome to the celebration of our school's 50th anniversary. Since 1942, many teachers and students have contributed to developing the traditions and character of Wynnum High. I am sure they have many fond memories they would like to share. This video represents a small sample of those memories. Hopefully they will help to give today's and future students some insight into the origin and development of the sense of loyalty and pride associated with Wynnum State High School. Of course, a school is always an integral part of the community in which it is set. Because of its geographic isolation, Wynnum Manly residents have always had a strong self-contained community which offers support and stability, and the school has always been a part of it. A decade after the building of Wynnum High, the world in Australia was gripped by an economic depression. However, the world was not confronted with seemingly insurmountable problems such as overpopulation and aids in television was still a long future. The like historian remembers a much more leisurely pace of life before World War II. Congregating, uh, particularly on, on Sunday, I know in history in the very early days of the railway lines, on Mondays to Fridays, there were probably only about two services in the morning and in the afternoon. But on Sundays, I understand there were seven trains you come down to the area to bring these people looking for a nice day out. Uh, community that lived to the west of Manly Road and to the west of where our high school is now, uh, the whole area was filled with small crop farms. As we've all heard, the Redlands area was known for its farming community, but Wynnum Manly was also a place where many, many families depended on their livelihood from what they could make on the farm. Right along Manly Road, out to that factory I mentioned of Hargraves and further on, there were lots and lots of small crop farms. There were dairy farms to be found up on the top of Tingle Road. There were dairy farms out Wandle Road. There were dairy farms out at Wandle Heights Way, and uh, so lots of people were finding an occupation working for perhaps a dairy farmer, working on a milk run. Uh, you also had no supermarkets then, and so the local shops, everything uh, depended on the people getting things, uh, not so much in bulk. When you went down to the butcher, you went to the butcher every day. People in their homes did not have a deep freeze. And they had an ice chest, so they had to buy their meat every day. Butchers did a roaring trade with the kids after school. When Wynnum High opened its doors to its foundation students, it must have been quite odd. The top floor and the roof, floor on the roof had not been constructed yet. There must have been a steady flow of noise and interruptions, possibly to the great amusement of some students. Darwin had been bombed by the Japanese Air Force in February 1942, so precautions were taken to minimise damage to the, in the event of local airstrikes. Glass windows in A Block were taped to prevent shattering and students were ordered to dig trenches on the marshy site where these tennis courts now stand.
was first completed, before the addition of other less graceful buildings, the school must have presented a truly imposing sight. The setting was a park dedicated to the memory of Anzacs, who died in World War I. It was, and still is, called Memorial Park. Its principal feature was an avenue of Norfolk pines, each bearing a sign inscribed with the name of a soldier. The first students who enrolled at Whitham High would not have been aware they were helping to establish enduring traditions. Most, like Ellen Jeffries, were just grateful not to have to travel to Brisbane to enjoy the benefits of secondary schooling. Being the first in the metropolitan area, other than those in the city of industrial, commercial uh, and state high, apart from the private schools, I think quite a few of us thought it was rather exclusive because we were the first. And yes, I would say right from those early days, we were establishing something, something to be very proud of. Um, one of the, one of the one of the uh, occupations in in the lunch hour was playing midget cricket, which we don't see today. It was played by uh, the lads at the time, and out in front of the school, a little downhill, but uh, about ten paces was the length of the the pitch. The bat was miniature, and that would be around about um, oh, 6 centimetres wide, I suppose, and about 30 centimetres long, and played with one hand and not two, and we would a little uh, wooden ball. We had great times. It was, it was just... Um, underarm bowling, of course, and uh, played in similar fashion to um, ordinary cricket. And uh, the teachers seemed to approve okay until one day uh, a mate of mine, Keith Geddes, uh, really hit the ball hard and walking down the track was Mr Lindrum. Unfortunately, it it uh, hit him in the mouth, and uh, I think from that day on that game was banned. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lindrum was not able to speak properly for a few days because he's, it hit him pretty hard and lips swelled up. There wasn't a friendly barrier, there wasn't a friendly sort of attitude as, like, as what there is today. Again, you sort of have the teachers in awe. You were very respectful to them, but you could approach them you know, as a student to an adult, and they're always willing to help you out, which was really good. They were very dedicated. Oh, very dedicated. I can remember. Well, Ian McColl, he was um, a scholarship teacher here. Bernie Lee, uh, Roy Phillips. I can always remember them, and Mr. Dalzell, I can't remember his name, Roy Dalzell, and I can always remember them, they're very special people to me, because they were extremely dedicated, lovely people, very high principle too. We played contested against others. Yes, schools. there was a very strong spirit, and um, especially with GPS time, and I sort of regret not having that spirit that they, well they sort of don't have the sort of spirit these days as what they did before. Because I can remember kids doing mi a mile run at the GPS Sport and everyone would wait for the last contestant to run through and every school would stand up and cheer that last contestant right through. I thought it was great to send a chill through you because it was, such, it was just so exceptional. Good sportsmanship. And you looked at that and it was great. I loved it. Yes, you had to work very hard. I used to do a lot of studying. I wasn't exceptionally bright. I used to be quite a few hours in at home every night. Yeah. I'd maybe do two or three hours study a night, easily. Did you feel that overall, though, it was uh, a very positive experience, pleasant experience being in high school? Mm, I loved it. It was very positive. I loved it. I loved the companionship of being at school. Um, it was just good, good fun. 
I enjoyed the companionship of teachers as well. And I was really sorry to leave the school. Very sorry. That was sort of the black day of my life, I think, when I left it, because I enjoyed it so much. I was here for only two years, about uh, 49 and 50. Uh, the school at that stage was, was very, very new. Uh, had new facilities, had gravel roads that ran down to it. Um, it was completely different, of course, to what it is now. And you must have thought it was uh, quite a good school because you sent your daughter, Carolyn, here. Yeah. When were you here, Carolyn? From 78 to 83. So I was here for the full five years. Mm -hmm. And the school was pretty much like it is now. With, uh, Few, few slight changes. I might say better reasons for, for wanting Carolyn to come here than the fact that, that I've been here. I've uh, just spent some time on the uh, inquiry into education and uh, in Queensland and we looked at, I looked at the, what was uh, at this school and uh, I think the, the principal would have been very pleased to know that uh, we couldn't come up with anywhere better to send her. A teenager, Carolyn, uh, what would have been the in way of uh, spending a weekend so you could tell your friends and be proud of it? The in way? We would leave the room with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you still don't know everything. <laughs> um, probably parties was the, the thing that we had more of um, because we complained even more than this generation seems to complain that there wasn't anything in Wynnum. We had the Wynnum Imperial, um, otherwise known as the Flea Pit, and you, you entertained yourselves by annoying everybody else by climbing underneath the seats. And when the movie's very interesting. No, worries. <laughs> no, I was only allowed to go a few times before it closed. It was the in place to go to. Um, and walking along the foreshore, was the, the foreshore was the meeting place. Um, the library was the meeting place. Meeting place with yeah. other girls? Were you allowed to go with boys on outings and to movies and yeah. things like that? Yeah, from about, about grade 8 I suppose. We were allowed to walk down to the flea pit and walk back again. That was, a, you know, that was about all that you had to do in, in Wynnum because you didn't go to town. You know, young kids didn't go to town like they do now, and besides the fact that you had even less trains um, and no buses, you had less trains than you, you did now, people are still complaining that the last train is at 12 o'clock, well you just didn't have them on a Sunday, Sundays it was something like you know, three or four, so there was, I never went to town. The sort of people who actually lived here, uh, has that changed? Uh, drastically through the decades from the 1950s? I think there's been a gradual change in the, in the Wynnum community, which uh, if you looked at it on a scale on a graph, it would have increased greatly over the last decade. But uh, it has been changing steadily. Um, ever since that time, ever since the 50s. And uh, I think a lot of us would say that the Wynnum was one of uh, Brisbane's best kept secrets for a long time. We knew that it was one of the best places in Brisbane to live because we had the sea breezes, we had a great community uh, spirit. Uh, and it's only in recent times since people come more to the sea, the boat harbour, I guess, has been the, the catalyst. Uh, the outsiders, as we call them, that have discovered the district and discovered how good it is. And that's brought a lot of changes. What uh, did a young teenager do uh, on weekends? There's pretty always, uh, or part, Things like the, the Tennis Association has always been strong. Uh, I don't think we had had the Table Tennis Association operating in those days. That came along a little bit later with any great thing for the young ones. But um, cricket was very hard to get into because there was only one team that you could play for. Uh, people used the foreshores probably a lot more. Um, as we got into the, the later teens, the motorbikes were the things. No, most of us couldn't afford cars. Uh, so there's quite a number of motorbikes um, along the foreshores of the, of the Saturday and Sunday afternoon. <laughs>
have been a period which clearly established the identity of our school in the Wynnum Manly community, then the 50s was a period of consolidation. Mr Holway, Mr Kafferke, Miss Nixon, these are all names which readily inspire admiration and respect in those who knew them for their dedication to the school. It is a small school by present day standards, uh, but um, although there might only have been 15 or 20 students in the class, we had uh, small classes, last, last, but very dedicated students. Um, the senior students in those days were self-motivated. You could leave a, a senior class, you could leave most classes in the school for quite a period of time. You could uh, go away and come back and uh, they'd be continuing with their allotted work because the motivation was there on the part of uh, particularly senior students who, who knew their goal, they knew where they were going. And um, it would not be uncommon to find uh, students selecting work for themselves in the absence of a teacher. Noise in the school was down almost to a minimum. Discipline was uh, no major problem whatsoever because the students, by and large, were, I think, more dedicated then than they are now. And for this school, the choice was to come here or to go to Brisbane and attend one of the four high schools in Brisbane. Having chosen to come here, they would have a choice of uh, academic, industrial, commercial, or home science. It's now called home economics. It was originally called domestic science. But those were the four choices. And depending upon the sort of career that a student had in mind, they would then enrol into one of those courses. And those courses were all uh, fairly uh, clearly defined. And, uh, it, it would have been unethical to try to convince them that you knew more than they knew, because you knew in reality that uh, they knew more than you did. And I think a good teacher would uh, be honest enough to admit that. But there were many students went through the school like that, and they were only a few. Uh, Errol Thrift was another one. They were, they were names that uh, come readily to mind. And each year we would have open scholarship winners. Uh, there was a family of Smiths, there was a family of uh, Sands, they went through this school, and uh, they were all academically very, very bright indeed, and very modest with it all too. This is typical of the nature of those sorts of people. We ascribed full value to the military aspects of training. We believe that impeccable dress and turnout, and a splendid parade ground performance, indicated correct thinking, the right, uh, right disciplined approach. It indicated a pride in self and a pride in the unit. But we recognised also that the widely differing environments of the parade ground and field days and bivouacs and camps provided an enormous number of buildings the development of character. Now, the three officers, uh, the three uh, teachers who uh, were interested, Mr. McCormick, Mr. Roy, and myself, we became the first officers of cadets. Mr. McCormick had been a flight lieutenant in the Royal Australian Air Force and with service in the Pacific area. Mr. Uh, Law had been a pilot officer and uh, <coughs> Excuse me, he had uh, uh, served in Australia, I think, at that time. Uh, my, own, my own experience uh, had been, uh, I think, uh, four or five years, four and a half years, we'll say, in an infantry battalion before the war. And then uh, during the war, I served as a commissioned officer in the South West Pacific area. Uh, so uh, it 
I suppose it was for that reason that uh, I was asked to become the officer commanding of the unit, and I was in fact the first one, the first officer commanding. Mr. McCormick became the, as a lieutenant, became the uh, training officer, and Mr. Law, as a lieutenant, became the quartermaster. <coughs> Excuse me, we had uh, Major General uh, Kerr, Mr. Hazel was the uh, acting principal, and uh, General Kerr uh, carried out the inspection. Then he came back to the dais, and then the, the, the unit then carried out what is called an advance and review order. It's quite a difficult uh, cere ceremonial drill. Well, in his remarks uh, following, uh, following the parade, the latter part of the parade, General Kerr said that he had never seen a better performance of the advance in review order. And that's, I have that letter written to Mr. Hazel, and he congratulated Mr. Hazel on the, on the cadet unit. Mr. Hazel gave the letter to me. I still have it in my records here. But he said something else which was of tremendous importance. He said that he had seen cadets in the UK, in Canada, and in New Zealand, and that Wynnum's cadets compared with the best. Now that was high praise indeed. I was uh, a student at school with Miss Nixon, will, as I said, never, never ever forget Miss Nixon. She had a very deep influence on all of us, and uh, if anyone ever knew we were in the playground that Miss Nixon was coming, there'd be a scream and a yell, Miss Nixon's coming, and everyone just run off. It was just remarkable. But uh, she taught all of us just so much, and as everyone said when we left school, uh, we didn't really appreciate her at the time. Um, I was a school captain as such, I did have a lot of association with her, and she was very, very kind and very, very thoughtful. And she was also deeply involved in GPS. Uh, with GPS, we used to compete in the swimming and athletics carnivals, and also on a Saturday. And uh, I remember I was in the netball team, and uh, she was our coach, and she was just so kind and so wonderful. She'd bring the fruit, and she would organise the fruit, and she'd look after the girls, and uh, any little problems that we had, if anyone was sick or anything like that, she's just so kind. In those days, when I first arrived on staff, I'm afraid um, it was rather a shock to me because I had been used to the country life, and uh, when I returned to Wynnum as a teacher, I got an entirely new perspective on the school. Uh, as from a student. Uh, we used to have a parade at the back of A Block every day, and a very rigid parade, uh, formed classes of course, but in those days we had to stand up straight, hands behind our back, form teacher had to be there, and when parade was dismissed there was no just walking off as you like, uh, we had to march in, so students had to march into school, uh, remember when they were going up the A block stairs, no one was allowed to talk. And so I found, coming from the country where that sort of thing didn't happen, I found returning to Wynnum quite an unusual experience and I felt these poor students, and of course it used to be the uniform, it used to be the skirt length, and uh, things in those days were extremely rigid, and yet students were very happy. Well, I first came to Wynnum High School in the middle of 1951, as uh, a boy from a, a country state school. Uh, I'd never been to an intermediate school before and I only spent the last six months of 1951 doing my scholarship at Wyndham High School. Uh, it was a big move for me, of course, coming from the country. Um, the environment, I, I didn't mind. It, there were a lot more uh, students around my own age than there had been. I came from a class of 14. and. Uh, I found that the teachers in the intermediate school were pretty formidable. Talking about art, um, um, when, when I was in intermediate, I think it was, I, I took art, and uh, art in the school at that stage consisted of um, lunchtime lessons from Miss Benham. Um, lunchtime? And, yeah, oh yes, it was just a... Uh, Miss Benham after, when he was... Uh, one afternoon a week. I remember being terrified of her. She would oh. pull my ear. Oh. For art? No, we, not just for art. But she was an a, 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 um, intermediate teacher, was she not? Not sure. I think so. But um, 
No. And, and so only a few students turned up and I really enjoyed that. Um, it was good fun, but um, that was it for art. Um, and for music, well, we had um, the occasional choirs and uh, that was all there was for music too. I can't so remember any music at all. They, were, they are particularly growth areas in, in curriculum. Mm. Mm. Um, we also agreed that probably the, the most um, important aspect of your memories of uh, high school were really um, the romances in it. The sort of, they were the most uh, lasting memories. Uh, when I was at uh, boarding school, one, um, one's communication with the opposite sex was um, in the form of letters. Um, and occasionally at a church, um, looking longly across to the other side of the church, because you never ever sat together. Uh, and to come back to Wynnum High and um, actually have boys in the same classroom was quite, quite terrific. So, um, yeah. Your, your memories of, of studies certainly rather um, retreat into the background. Was the interaction regulated very rigidly? Could you talk? You could actually talk oh, in the yeah, playground yeah. in senior yeah. years. I don't know what it was like in junior years. Of course, yes, that's right. Because they were um, pretty small, intimate numbers. Um, probably the, the, as each year got bigger. Um, you lost a lot of that closeness. Yeah. Were all classes uh, mixed or just a few? Well, it was like Finish depending speaking. on the subject only. Some subjects were nearly all male or nearly all female. The woodwork classes would have been totally male exclusive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, um, the commercial would have been almost exclusively mm -hmm. female. And uh, it was um, in my senior years that uh, Home Ec um, became a, a senior course. So uh, I think there were three or four of them there. That was enough to, to start it off. Yeah. Do you remember any uh, romances that uh, blossomed into marriage eventually? Oh, heaps, yes. heaps of them. I could go on and on. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, for instance, in um, in my year, the um, the school captain, Margaret Kerr, she married her sweetheart, Richard Barnett, who was from Ralph's year, um, and uh, her sister, Janet, who was a uh, school captain a couple of years behind, and she married another Barnett. Um, yep. Would be uh, would be really uh, uh, sort of very sports minded, and it was only probably in the in the latter years in the, in the latter uh, the senior groups where where you'd get um, well discussion between boys and girls, and this this came about in so much as uh, we used to have, as I said, school social evenings where we had dances. Uh, and before any of these, these uh, socials or balls, we used to have dancing practice in the corridors. Uh, and the teachers would, uh, would instruct the boys and girls how to dance. And there would be somebody play a piano, and on the cement floors of the corridor in A block, uh, we would uh, be put through the, uh, the, the paces of doing a, a waltz and a gypsy tap and a uh, uh, the pride of error and uh, barn dance, these these sorts of things. Uh, a more uh, devoted couple, it was just a shame that they never had any family of their own. I think that's probably why all of Mr. Holloway's students were his family, and this is why he, he, can, he could recall graphically things that we had forgotten ourselves years later. But he was a gentleman's gentleman. Um, he would get very, very upset, visibly upset, uh, if with these stories coming back from from uh, uh, 
people, all the, all the students, not doing the right thing and travelling to and from school whilst, whilst in school uniforms and things like this. He would have general parades in which he would stand on top of the stairs and speak to the, the whole, the whole uh, uh, both intermediate and high school. And uh, if you were ever called out in front of a, a grand parade, it was the, the, the most dreadful thing to happen to you in, in the whole of the school career, to be belittled in front of the, all of your friends there. So, uh, you know, you, you try to do the right thing. And, uh, and uh, he was, as I say, a, a disciplinarian, uh, although he didn't wield a, a great crane, but everybody respected him. They, uh, they really thought that, that, uh, that they were proud to be at a school of which he was principal. In enrolling at Wynnum High, I followed my father's footsteps, who left school in 1956 and later started a real estate agency in the area. My father has a strong sense of community spirit and helped to organise the restoration of the Shire Clark's cottage. We called in to ask him about changes to the Bayside area since the 50s. What I've seen as a real estate agent since 1957 is that we've seen um, we've seen the area grow from uh, a district which was separated from the greater Brisbane area by its very nature. So much so that the girls from Wynnum North married the fellows from Manly and yeah. so on. Uh, and uh, to become part of the Greater Brisbane area, and, and we've seen that the people who would go and live in uh, Mount Cravat uh, who wouldn't have considered Wynnum in, uh, in the 60s and 70s are now coming to live in Wynnum. And so I, I have uh, in this town at the moment one of the most successful motor dealers, Stan Green, Regal Motors. Uh, Stan's been very successful and uh, Stan was uh, in my grade at school. Um, Bill Beverly was the uh, master dealer here for many years. There are many others that have uh, been very successful in, uh, in business. There are many others who've made a great success of, um, of their lives by going into the um, into the um, public sector. Um, my friend Bob Rose, who's uh, at one stage was the Deputy Commissioner of Housing Commission and is now a very senior transport department officer, is another example of a Wynnum High student. There's a real network of Wynnum High people out there. I'm finding it. Uh, increasing. In fact, uh, a number of our clients here are ex real high students. brought with it a mood of change around the world. Young people rejected the materialistic ethic of their parents and were determined to rebel and experiment with new ways of life. However, if we ignore the desire of some students to imitate their pop idols and to let their hair grow, Wynnum High continued essentially unchanged. The most important change in the 60s was the retirement of Mr Kavaki in 1966, seen by many as the end of the old conservative values in education. Certainly, 
Jack Guy, the new principal, considered himself an agent of inevitable change. But change is something that every one of us is doing all the time. We're changing. We don't change our personalities, perhaps, as markedly as all that, but we certainly change from day to day. Our physical changes are taking place all the time. Uh, we change furnishings around. We change, when we do, anyhow, change curtains and change frocks and all these sorts of things. And change is part of living. I mean, change and growth and these sorts of things. Uh, but I found it very difficult. To, uh, perhaps I tried to introduce things uh, too quickly, too many things. I uh, tried to introduce democracy within the school staff, but they didn't want a democracy. They didn't want a democracy. They, are uh, like most teachers that I've found, want to be told the parameters within which they work and go ahead and do the work, and that's it. From your perspective, later on when you left the school, would you classify Wyndham High as being particularly traditional and conservative? Yes, I certainly would. And it drew and kept conservative and traditional people. Does that, uh, can that be positive in your view? Do you think? Yes, I think it is. Because I think, personally, uh, there is um, room for flair there's room for style in every organisation, but it should have a basic core of hard traditional action to accept that. Uh, we did have a fair bit of uh, success, I would think. Uh, we never had much success in rugby league all the time that I was there. Stephen Paul was supposed to be the coach, and the amount of thumping up and down those internal stairs within A block from the basement to the top floor, along the top floor and down and up and down, so developed them perhaps. But then there was a, another fellow at Kelvin Grove, at, uh, it wasn't Kelvin Grove, it doesn't matter where in here, uh, that uh, probably outshined his coach. I'm not too sure whether that's true. But He's the, not going to like us when he hears that. The team, the team certainly uh, always won. And Kevin was, at that particular time, we could never beat Kevin. And that was... In the past few years, it's been named Kevin. <laughs> <just like that. laughs> never beat great Kevin. stumbling block. Never could beat Kevin. Uh, we had great success in tennis and that sort of thing. We had great success in cricket. Jimmy Steele was, an, and he's still there, of mm, course. Jim yeah. came the same year as I did. He's been there since 67. Uh, he in his own quiet way, uh, brought home the bacon and uh, go to the Metropolitan Cricket. When kids left Wynnum High to go on any uh, expedition, whether it was a, a cricketing expedition or whatever, I always felt proud of them. They always looked good and they always had a good attitude. And that was the most important thing as far as I was concerned. One distinctive positive feature of Wynnum High is the pleasing grounds of its setting. The person who has maintained a continued commitment to making Wynnum a pleasant green place is Miss Bunn, who this year celebrates the 30th anniversary of her association with the school. She has served in the capacity as languages teacher, subject master, senior mistress, and is presently deputy principal. <laughs> uh, you know, globally there's a lot of fun in different movements, uh, protests. Uh, did uh, any of, of that kind of reverberate here in the school, from your point of view? Well, not in the, not in the sense that there were, you know, lots of demonstrations and, and things like that. But I, it did have an enormous effect. It certainly had an enormous effect on the um, on uniform, because we had previously uh, been a very strict uniform school. I mean, Miss Nixon was famous for her her uh, insistence on the Panama hats in, in in summer and berets in winter, and gloves on the girls and that sort of thing. And uh, 
you know, we had always had boys who had very neat short back and sides hairstyles and things like that. And gradually uh, there was a change from insisting that these things be, the, these sorts of standards be adhered to, to simply having to accept that, uh, yeah, boys were going to wear their hair longer and, and uh, girls like their like other women out in society were not going to wear gloves all the time you know, and that sort of thing it made it um, well I don't remember it as being terribly difficult because I was a classroom teacher then and life as a classroom teacher is vastly different from from uh, you know, being in the administration but I know that it made things very difficult for Miss Nixon because she found it very hard to cope with um, well what with what I saw as a change, but which of course to her was a, a deterioration in standards. I would think too that the, the uh, foment of the 60s is, is responsible for a lot of the, uh, the changes that have occurred, because it meant that people really had to look again at what they were doing, because it's obvious that the old ways weren't going to work anymore, that kids were less I suppose less accepting of um, you know, rigid syllabuses and so on. Forward aspect of this school, would you give us a bit of an outline on just some of the achievements, sporting achievements uh, of the school? Yeah, well, just roughly, I can give you a bit of an idea. Um, since we got our swimming field, of course, our swimming team has improved immensely. We've had an awful lot of success uh, in the swimming at Chandler, against other schools and uh, other districts. Uh, touch football, that uh, Peter Bell's involved in that. We got a phenomenal result with that too, but even to Australian stand, with getting about five students, I think, from the school in the Australian side, so that was a great achievement for Peter, and let alone the school itself, with the girls and touch on. Uh, cricket, I said, I've been involved in A-grade cricket, so that's sort of passed on to the kids. We've won uh, one A-grade football championship. We've been, we featured in a few finals, three others, I believe. We haven't won, but we've been runners up in that. Big Red Cycle has won two uh, Metropolitan Finals, so that's extremely good too for a school the size. And uh, athletic-wise, we've won the uh, Bayside competition seven years in a row, I believe it is, well, at least seven years anyway. And uh, the de dedication put in by phys ed teachers and other teachers and supporters is really terrific. And the kids just respond to that because I think if you've got nothing else, if you know a true academic skills, at least you've got something to achieve on the sporting field. And the other way around, of course, if you achieve in the athletic field, well then they can often help you in the academic world because you've got that extra confidence behind you. And you feel as though you know, you're achieving something, you can head on for bigger and better things too. And the school certainly hasn't lost anything by the effort and the, and, uh, the achievements they, they have arrived at over the years with the students that are involved in the school. Christian fellowship groups have always been an important part of our school. They help to emphasise the spiritual dimension of life and creates a sense of belonging. In the early 60s, while Mr. Noel Sims was a student here, he was involved in the Christian movement, then called Crusaders. We asked him to speak about the Crusaders and other aspects of his school life at Wynnum High. In, in uh, Wynnum High School in 1960s, there was a Crusader group. Um, Crusader was a Christian group, interdenominational Christian group which has now been replaced by, or it's now called ISCF, Interschool Christian Fellowship. And at that time there were a boys group and a girls group. The boys group would, they would each meet weekly in a lunch hour, their studies, I'll call them studies because they mainly were studies, chorus singing perhaps included. Their studies were taken basically by people outside the school who'd come in for that lunch hour. Um, the, the boys group was something like 15 students, the girls group probably 60 students and on occasions uh, when they did combine there would have been as many as say 100, 150, a fairly significant proportion of the school population. And I think this reflects the greater proportion of students who were involved in churches at those times. An interesting experience that uh, we had a, a senior mistress, Miss Nixon, who was affectionately known as Granny or perhaps maybe not affectionately known either. Uh, she enforced strictly the fact of complete segregation of the sexes in the school grounds at that time. 
So boys and girls weren't allowed to talk to one another and weren't allowed to walk home with one another. My wife, Julie, uh, and I walked home because she would catch the train from Manly Station and I lived not too far away from it. One afternoon we were standing on the street corner talking to one another before her train left and, and Miss Nixon or Granny drove by. The next morning my twin brother, who was a, a school captain at the time, got summoned to, to Miss Nixon and said, please explain why you were standing on the street corner talking. And it, it wasn't uh, him at all. So he protested and said, it must have been my brother. So I got the summons and the reprimand then, but it, uh, it was, I guess, a sign of the times of the 60s that um, a decision like that could be made and, and be enforced. I think that uh, the whole school environment was uh, more tightly run. I'm not saying that that was always a good thing. Um, the freedoms today have their advantages, but uh, sometimes we could do with a little bit more discipline. I guess I'm old fashioned and showing my age. Another distinguished Wynnum High student of the 60s is Hendrik Gout. He's worked as an executive producer of the 730 Report for several years. He transferred to Wynnum High from a private school for his senior years. Comfortable too, because um, it didn't seem to me as much pressure, you know, as there was um, a churchy in order to uh, impress people with the same standard of clothes and the cars your friends picked you up in. It was a much more livable place, really. I was much more comfortable now for that. Um, I would think that the top earning people at Churchy earn, you know, pretty close to the top earning people at uh, William High and vice versa. But people were less embarrassed about the fact that their father worked in different places or their mother didn't work or, you know, and I, and I dare say that they generally had a lower level of debt too. Um, I, um, I think overall that William High School had a broader cross-section of people than, um, than Churchill, and a healthier one for that. Now I'm not allowed to talk about it, does. You actually knew that Wynnum area pretty well as, uh, as a society. I mean, did you live there a long time? Or? Yeah, I grew up in Wynnum. Uh, I grew up in Manly. In fact, now I live in the house I grew up in. I bought the house in 19... I grew up in a bush, basically speaking, and, and we were close enough to the waterfront to walk down the waterfront, and I found it was perfectly safe, and our parents never locked the house, um, and we used to go paddling in the, in the creeks, down, you know, by the creek, and it was just mangrove swamps, and basically the sort of healthy environment that kids grow up in. And I and, and no pressure, basically, as a kid, even as a, uh, even, even as a teenager. No peer pressure to get involved in things we didn't want to get involved in. Um, no drugs, no alcohol. Um, not even any sex. And didn't really figure in people's minds. Really, most people just wanted to have a reasonable time and do that without hurting other folk. Um, I don't um, think of a nice area to grow up in, really, and uh, win a manly at that time. A sign of the loyalty past students feel towards Wynnum High is the continuing association they maintain with their school and their school friends. Last year, Mr Finlay, after a successful military career, decided he would like to renew some old acquaintances. After hundreds of phone calls and much organisation, this reunion celebration took place. Stop shuffling on parade. Oh, 
In terms of the extent of building, the first half of the 70s saw our school double in size. But in terms of staff, the changes proved to be even more dramatic. In 1974, the year of the devastating floods, Mr Miles took over the principalship of Wynnum High. He must have had some difficulty inducting new teachers to the school. About half of them were new to the school. Well, the building program, or well, this building program had started with uh, the block, the Commonwealth uh, Science block in 1968, I think, and F block around about the same time. Then it really started. We got the continuation of F block, which took the uh, manual art of graphic department or tech drawing in those days from underneath A block over to underneath uh, F block. Then eventually they were shifted upstairs. After and then the art section was filled in under F block, which brought it from upstairs, and the commercial took over. When G block was built, we finally got out of Moundsville, only to see them come back again about 10 years later, when we went up to 1,400 students, and they were put over on the lawn in the front of the school. And so there's been a lot of building changes in a short period. Was it easy to maintain discipline with uh, students at that time? Not the first year or so, but generally it would only be about 20 or 30, but uh, we used to try to talk to them, but unfortunately if they wouldn't listen you have, with the boys you have to resort to a bit of corporal punishment, but you'd go through the, at the end of the year the corporal punishment register and you'd find it'd be the same dozen, and eventually it wasn't even when the school was 1400 I doubt the percentage had risen, in fact I think it had dropped. And, uh, but I think that's because the staff provided more and more outlets for them. When you have a school musical and you have hundreds uh, wanting to get it in no matter what, and it was a thing for the seniors, if they hadn't got on that stage in one of the school productions, they'd miss something when they were at school. I know that the students were pretty keen students. Uh, yes. They worked pretty hard? They were. Academic-wise, they worked hard. Sports-wise, they worked hard. The only thing that I felt needed um, improving was some of the cultural activities, particularly music. You'd have a choir for speech night, but that would be about it. We had a band with the Army cadets. When they folded because of government policy changes, we lost that band. And then when I heard that Balmoral High School were getting a musical instrumentalist, I couldn't see why Wynnum shouldn't. And so I got onto the department, onto the primary schools, and asked them would they back me, and they said yes. In 1974-85, all the principals of the South Brisbane region were called in 
to have a look at what subjects we could introduce uh, because of the student or the people who weren't going to get jobs in 1975-76. Fortunately, that didn't occur. They thought we were going to get swamped out in year 11. But we had ideas there. And when it did start to gradually come in, around about 1979, we used business typing, secretarial studies, uh, manual arts, and then, then we found another period and about 83, introduced music, senior, and then later on still came marine studies, applied business principles. These students who were coming on who didn't want a TE school or didn't want to go on to tertiary education, but they wanted to come on to senior. And we were getting 60% return of students here when it was about 40 to 50 elsewhere. I got a lot out of seeing the students um, perform academically, musically, and the, the last speech night, I was glad that I talked them into that instrumental teacher when I heard that band. As I said to Zilla Bun, the Big Oaks from Little Acorns great. And it's great to see these things that the seeds have been sown in your time, see them come to fruition. I think that's the best thing I've got out of it. And some good friends. Up the mass staff room. It's the home of three of the school's natives. They're mass teachers, three highly capable and respected mass teachers. Trouble uh, fell in, in them into shape in the first few years we're here. Uh, our methods some people mightn't agree with. Uh, I might just relate one other story to you about how he operates was one particular student. I'll mention his name too. Hopefully he, he might come back and uh, look for us. But a fellow by the name of uh, Swallow. And he was giving a few people a hard time. So the three of us here were involved. We got together and we said, look, we've got to sort this fellow out. And uh, you know, get him to our way of thinking. So I had him a particular period and I said to uh, Richard, I said, you come in and all you've got to do is point to him and say, yeah, that was him, Mr. Knight, and we'll you know, put a bit of pressure on him. So this was a period after lunch and Richard came to the door, walked in the room and he just pointed to this Michael Swallow and he said, yes, that's him, Mr. Knight. He said, no doubt about it. He said, I saw him. I said, right, I swallow out here. I said, there you go. You can't get out of this one. I said, you've been caught red-handed. I said, what did you do? not knowing that he'd done anything. And uh, Swallow stood there for a while and said, come on out with it. And he said, oh, all right. And he said, he said, I only stuffed a dead bird into a girl's port. I said, right. I said, there, so you got caught. I said, where's the bird now? He said, sir, he said, I threw it over the railway. Line. I said, go down and get it. So off he went. About five minutes later, he arrives back in the room and he's got this dead bird in his hand. I said, OK, up to the staff room. I said, you can go and wait up there. So he went up to the math staff room. He was standing outside with dead bird in hand. And Clarkie happened to walk out. And he stood there and looked at this kid with the dead bird in his hand. And he said, Sparrow, he said, what are you doing here? And Swallow had had enough by this stage, and he couldn't take any more. And he said, Sir, he said, my name's not Sparrow, it's Swallow. And Clark, he said to him, listen, son, he said, you just shut up. He said, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the bird. And <laughs> ever since then, we never had any trouble with that kid. He came round to our way of thinking, and uh, yeah, that was it. But by and by, the, uh, the kids were pretty good. Uh, as I said, they were a little bit rough, a little bit countrified, but, uh, you know, we, uh, after a few years, got to know their ways, they got to know ours, and uh, never really had much trouble with them. Uh, we got to know each other a lot better, mm -hmm. but now the school's grown, not so much in population, but in, uh, in staff room and building space. Um, you know, you, people are more scattered, there's less people congregated in uh, more staff rooms, I suppose you'd say. You think maybe at that time too that teaching was uh, more easygoing, not quite as stressful? Has the, the act of teaching changed all that much? The responsibilities that you have now. I think I think the only thing that's changed is in you, with, with regard to the way you teach kids today.
uh, you, you've got to be a little bit more careful that you don't back them into a corner. In those days, then you could back them into a corner. If they come out fighting, you probably knock them, knock them down, or you know what I mean, something like that. Nowadays, you've got to be a little bit more uh, tactful uh, that you don't back them into a corner because uh, they're quick to run for uh, legal aid and, or uh, legal eagles or whatever, you know. Um, the actual kids in the classroom, their attitudes to work and so on, I don't think that's changed much at all. And uh, there's a lot more subjects around for them to do. A lot more, aren't there? Yeah, well, there seem to be fewer hours, hours in the day now. Um, we've got a, so many other things going on that we didn't have. There's always the kids are off at this and off at that. Well, of course, music didn't break in those days, did it? There was no music block, no science block. And so there, there seemed to be more teaching time. I think the stress that's coming in these days is a lot of it because you're trying to do the same amount of work in a reduced amount of time because of all the other activities that are pressing on you all the time. So. You know, somewhere else, and uh, they are a closely knit community. And as I said, you know, a, uh, they're countrified. I mean, you wouldn't call it a country town, but uh, it's probably the closest thing to it, you know, in the middle of uh, Brisbane, if you like. And uh, the kids just all seem to be the same. Well, you know, all, each generation that comes through, they, they seem to, uh, you know, relate to the uh, previous generation and do the same thing. I think, yeah, I think socio socioeconomically, they're a little bit better off today than they were in those days mm -hmm. because of the way housing and, 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 and uh, real estate down this area has, has sort of really boomed. I think you'll find, you'll find they're a bit better off socioeconomically. But um, they haven't, the, the, the fundamental idea of Wynnum being Wynnum and the rest is Brisbane, that's still there, isn't it? It's changing a bit though, I think, because uh, in the early days, the students were coming with parents, their parents had uh, fled the, the city in the depression. They'd come out here where you could catch a fish and grow a few veggies. And so we had those. And now we've got a lot of uh, retired people moving into the area with money. And uh, so it's changing that way. And so that's uh, one of the reasons we've got you know, a, high, a high level and a low level, if you like, uh, of, of students coming with very different backgrounds. Because there's still the old people here who are living in the old original houses. They're being pushed out with all the new estates. So that's changing the way the school feels. I think. Friday afternoon, half the staff would be down at the, uh, the Manly Pub, wouldn't they? Yeah, the Miller would be down there. We'd fill that whole room just about, uh, all their, every discipline. And now, you know, that doesn't happen. They have little dudes here. But in those days, there'd be um, Clodagh and Murray Hill and... Uh, John Fenton. Yeah, Peter Morrissey. Mick Orozengo. Mick Chris Berza. I mean, Adrian Miles. Yes. Yeah, Adrian used to be Yeah. And then you get and people who used to teach there, like Sam Barnier, he's from the SMA of Winner North, he'd be down there. Because we used to mix, there'd be three or four people from Winner North turn up, and then you'd get other people like uh, Jeff um, Mikey. Right. He's dead now, Jeff. Um, he used to be down there. Quite a, quite a, I can't think of them all. Because we did build the cohesion, though. Mm -hmm. well, we had a lot in common, didn't we? Mm -hmm. and we we're a lot of great mates and we still see and mix with some of the people of those yeah. days. Well, that, that was the right. thing. We see most of them, really, well, I mean, yeah. except for the ones that are, you know. Well, particularly towards the end of my time there, um, that was in the middle of the moratorium marches and things like that, and there were some sort of spillovers and people were talking about little red school books and that was having some impression on a on a small minority of students. Um, I'd have to confess I was one of that minority. So some of us were starting to agitate for you know, students to have a say, and um, for some form of uh, being able to, uh, you know take complaints or take issues to the teachers. Now, certainly in that process we we took a lot of the teachers off a pedestal. Um, we, we, some of us, we took things a little bit further one day. We you know, resolved one particular day that we weren't going to wear uniforms and uh, we resolved that we wouldn't wear ties and uh, we weren't all, I think we were probably secretly hoping we all cast into the bin but we were generally ignored. About three quarters of the uh, 
students turned up with their uniform on and our publicised no uniform day. Very much the minority. A couple of us went up to uh, you know moratorium marches, which were the big thing in you know 1970, 71, 72. Into Brisbane. Into Brisbane. Yeah, but we. So you weren't wearing your winter school uniform at the time. <laughs> well, I can't remember actually. We would have because we didn't tell our parents. So we would have had to go to school in uniform, whether we had you know, clothes tucked away and we got changed in the train or something, I, I really can't remember. But, uh, the teachers we talk about um, these sorts of things to say in English and other subjects. They acknowledge that all this is kind of happening and comment about it and discuss it. No, no, in English we had a uh, we had a teachers union officially later became a state politician. Lyle Shuntner, who never talked about the, the issues of the day, spoke a lot about Shakespeare. Most of us weren't very interested in. Well, there, were, there was a there was a reasonably uh, solid group of us, and we were you know, because we'd come up in the academic stream, we were treated, you know, as the elite. Um, I suppose you had a symptom that because of the the political currents of the time and, you know, Vietnam and that sort of thing, that uh, enough of the elite rebelled to make a minor change for, uh, I think it was all of one year or something, until we got too busy <laughs> with our exams. I think I knew a lot about school, but then it was quite a rough school. Um, the stories that they would tell always seemed horrendous after going, I went to Manly State School, which was a lovely little, little country type of school. Well, you knew everyone, it wasn't a very large school, the students knew each other. Mm. But Wyndham High was so close to home, it was only natural. It was only just down the road, really, from where I was living, so there wasn't a real option for me to attend another school. And all my friends were going there, which makes a big difference, I think. Yeah, yeah I think for myself, all my brothers and sisters certainly went to Wyndham High, so it was inevitable I'd go there. I guess really where, where home was, I, I could have gone to either to Wyndham North or Wyndham High, Perhaps I like going to Wyndham High because it had a more of a spectacular building. I thought Wyndham North wasn't spectacular enough. Mm -hmm. Looking high school, I think most students mm -hmm. had there. Uh, there would always be the few romances that happened on the uh, camp out, I guess, or uh, initiated them that uh, many have gone through, or well, a few that we, you're referring to, I think, have gone on to, to, mar to marriage. Um, but uh, that's, that's another highlight, I think, of my senior years, at mm -hmm. least, uh, is the Marine Outdoor Education Centre. Uh, and the 10 days spent there doing outdoor activities. In fact, I think really that's a turning point in my life and my, in many of my interests too, which even influences my artwork today. Um, I think as, as a career, I've chosen the, the path of a wildlife artist, which deals primarily in outdoor subject matters, like wildlife in particular being the main, main subject matter. And, and although I've always had an interest in outdoors and family camping, camping trips, etc., but it's the 10 days course and uh, doing things like abseiling, rock climbing, uh, studying different species around you, whether flora or fauna or flora, uh, overnight trips, uh, three-day hike outs, and you know, this has sort of opened my eyes to the outdoors a lot. And it changed my, as I said, my interest and a lot of my activities I'll do for recreational purposes afterwards, uh, even to the point now that it has a major influence on my career. Rafting, not rafting. Canoeing. Canoeing out on the dam. And it started to get really overcast, so we were sort of all just mucking around in the water. And they were all um, steel rimmed canoes with steel rim paddles and then it started to get really overcast and started to rain and there was this huge dead tree out in the embankment sort of just near the campsite and it got struck by lightning and we're out in the middle of this dam with aluminium paddles. I think